All right. Let's get this kicked off. Hi, everyone. I'm Tyler. I'm hosting this event tonight. Uh, welcome to the Society of Plays uh, Game Dev Eulogies or Game Project Funerals. Today, we're going to be talking about and sharing projects that sadly uh, have been dropped, that have passed away, that I know 2020 has been a rough and difficult year for a lot of us, and we thought one of the ways that we could kind of celebrate the finally no longer being in 2020 is by, um, well, talking about things that we're leaving behind us and talking about projects that are dead, things that we're not going to finish, and just kind of, in a cathartic way, work through this together a little bit. Um, so this is a live stream, um, but we're going to be hanging out in the Discord afterwards, um, and quite a few of us are already hanging out in the Discord. Um, so we're going to be doing talks, and if there, you have any questions, go join the Discord and talk to the developers there. Um, just to go through uh, some announcements really quick before we get started. Uh, first, uh, in January, we're going to be having a career day. So if you are a student or new to the games industry and you're looking to get in, or maybe you're in an adjacent industry and you're wanting to kind of sidestep your way into the games industry, um, this is going to be an event that we're hosting where we're getting seasoned, experienced developers in art and sound and code to do portfolio view reviews, to do um, resume reviews. So if you want to just talk to someone to see how your stuff looks and how that would be received by someone in the industry, this would be a great opportunity. Um, and if you're a seasoned veteran and you want to volunteer to help out, reach out to us, PM one of the organizers, um, and we'd love to have you help us out. Um, and that's going to be sometime in January. Check out the Discord for more info once we know exactly when it's going to be. Uh, we also have a Discord social every single Thursday. So every single Thursday night, we're hanging out on our Discord at 7 p.m. We're playing Tabletop Simulator or some other game. Um, or we're just talking, talking about game design, talking about game development, talking about our projects. Sometimes people will just share what they're, they've been making and we'll QA test it. We'll literally just play people's games and talk about it. So if you want to hang out with game developers every single Thursday, 7 p.m. without fail, since today is a Thursday, it's also tonight. It's just whenever the stream is over. Uh, like I said before, if you want to join our Discord, go to this link. It's bit.ly forward slash DSOP Discord. That's Dallas Society of Play Discord. We are a nonprofit. We are based out of Dallas, but we are a nonprofit for anyone, anywhere. We used to host a lot of local events, but uh, especially thanks to COVID, we mostly exist online. So we're trying to open our doors a bit more to anyone who wants to hang out with us and be a part of the community. Um, so come join our Discord, regardless of whether you live in the area or not. That's the link. I'll share it again later. And of course, a special thanks to our patrons. We do have a Patreon. Uh, we were able to do things like buy Facebook ads for this event, so to help reach out and get the word out to people that are in the area um, about this event. Um, it's things like that um, that allow us things. Uh, it's because of our patrons that we're able to do things like that, but also whenever we do have in real life events again, uh, we'll be able to rent out spaces. We're able to buy food for people. We're able to pay taxes that we have to file every year as a nonprofit. So thank you so much to our patrons that allow us to throw events like this. Um, just, we appreciate you. Thank you very much. Uh, and also thank you, Pig Squad. Pig Squad is a lot like Society of Play, but they're out of Portland. Uh, and they are actually the first place that we saw people hosting eulogies or funerals for game development projects. So I just wanted to give a quick shout out to them. If you're ever in the area, check them out. They're a really great group of people. Um, and that said, these are our speakers. Got Sam, Liz, Summer, Eric Grossman, and myself, and Daniel giving talks. Um, we'll be going in that order. Uh, but first, Sam. Uh, in my first year and a half of game development, I worked on a side scroller. I, uh, I called it Mud Wizard. The project became a wild beast of esoteric and ambitious features, so I started what would become a series of side projects. One of those was a game called Lenore Red's Magic Cookbook. It's nothing special, or at least that's how I see it. Moving values from container to container to mixing them together. I forgot what wild hair gave me the idea, but I just redid everything the same way I did I learned in a Mud Wizard. The same method of moving inventory items through parents. The project was definitely beyond my skill level at the time, but I never could just want to make a regular ass game. I worked on Lenora for about two to three months before just abandoning it. On my phone, 
While at work, I sometimes use an app called Pixel Studio. On it, I have a folder titled Cancelled. It's mostly ideas that I never got around to, or really planned out a whole lot. Mostly just a few sprites, maybe a Google Doc. Here, through the while sorting through the mess of files, I'm always very bad about that, I placed Lenora. Now, besides Mud Wizard, Lenora was the longest game I just straight out abandoned. I always planned to go back to Mud Wizard, but Lenora was just a game that I worked on the longest and to abandon. Why was it something that I put so much work and passion into, and I just gave up on it? It had a very personal story to me. The main character was learning to bake to get in touch with their disappeared relatives. While I'm not a magic little girl, um, I don't have the best relationship with my parents. There was going to be an ant character that didn't really approve of the main character's baking, and that kind of reminded me of what it was like being in high school and college. Uh, and despite all this, I just shelved it. I put it in a folder with the rest of the stuff I'll probably never have time to go back to. Archived, probably to be lost like so many half-finished D&D campaigns and books. You never know when the last time you work on something is ever going to be. When the last time you ever play a game. Will I ever come back? Have I played my last round of World of Warcraft? Burnout. It's always burnout. Most of the time. In Lenore's case, it was the measuring cup system. When I started out, I barely knew what I was doing. And it didn't always work out right. Things would just disappear. Measurements wouldn't work right. Stuff wouldn't work as intended. Not getting something to work is frustrating. Usually an hour or two a satisfactory or whatever sandbox game I'm into at the time usually fixes that. But not after days of this frustration. Not after weeks. Not after a 10 hour shift in a job I hate and a world I hate. Why do I keep coming back to this hobby? This frustrating math problem that most of the time doesn't even have a clear ending to it. It's just something I work on for months with no clear results. I mean, I get burned out on a lot of stuff. I got burned out on playing Dungeons and Dragons. I got burned out on writing fiction and video production and coding, just like D&D tools. Why can't I ever finish anything? Why do I always burn out on everything? And hopefully that is our saddest and grimmest take on someone's canceled project. I got the idea. Uh, but uh, hey, we're not done yet. It's going to keep going. I got the idea to come back to Lenora around the same time I was asked to do this. I was working on a procedurally generated overhead game, um, and I just wanted to give myself a break, so I didn't burn out on that as well. So I went back to Lenora. I redid the whole measuring cup system from the ground up, and it actually works this time. I'm probably going to put it shelving again, at least for a while. I still don't enjoy doing data entry and putting in a lot of recipes doesn't really sound fun right now so I'll probably spend the rest of the year working on uh, my overhead game. I do enjoy game development I mean why would I keep doing it if I didn't? Sometimes it's not about finishing a product or making it marketable it's about finding something that you like to do and just putting one foot and forward and just keep on going. Hey folks, welcome to our... Uh, in my first year and a half... Spoilers. Uh, cool. Thank you, Sam. And although we have many pre-recorded, we have a couple of pre-recorded talks going on tonight. Many of them are live. So first, going into our first live talk is Liz. Let me go ahead and get this set up. Hey, 
I dragged you over here, Liz. All right. All right. Share your screen if you don't mind. And we're live. Wait, let me actually let me go back and see if I can work. Mm -hmm. Too late. All right. So uh, my name is Liz Gravis. I am a uh, game dev. Uh, I've never released anything, but I swear I can do this shit. Just trust me. Um, if you've seen if you've seen any of my work at any of my at any game jams I've submitted to, you'll probably probably be able to confirm. Anyway, I'm here to talk about my abandoned project, Mike's Worlds. So what was Mike's Worlds? Well, it was a 3D platformer. It was supposed to be set in, like, these surreal dream worlds, right? Like, I had this very specific tone I was going for. So you're basically trying to escape in a shifting, unpredictable hub world. Uh, the gameplay had a huge emphasis on gra reaching out, grabbing things with your, with your hands. Uh, a lot of movement, stuff like that. Also, this was my first try ma making a 3D game. Surprisingly, though, I did get a lot out of it. All right, here's a screenshot. That's Mike. He's a wanted man. He's a solid light being that murdered a man and ate and stole his face. Now he started walking around trying to be him. So uh, he gets put in some kind of in some kind of astral jail, right? He escapes, but he finds himself uh, lost in a. Uh... Well, okay, I think I put the slides out of order. Anyway, um, so he ends up getting lost in this in, in in this big mysterious hub world, right? His his goal is to find redemption by bringing order to the worlds and uh, escape his new prison. The worlds would have been presented as like these tiny little systems, right? Like a uh, uh, like a little ecosystem where something is kind of messing things up and throwing off the balance, and like a. Uh, Basically, your goal is to restore order to those worlds, right? As you can see, here's a couple of uh, unused world concepts. The hub world, though, was a huge, shifting, unpredictable mall. That was like the kind of the kind of the the, the hook. I, I I couldn't scare up a lot of concept art of that. There's a little. But like basically, you would wait. You basically like uh, like I've always had ha had like recurring dreams set in in like malls after closing, where like you go into stores and and just everything changes. I thought it'd be a cool concept as like a hub world in a three D platformer. So basically, you know, you have these worlds that you go that you you that you enter through the shops and the back rooms, and then you solve their problems example one of those worlds was a hive world just a world po populated by friendly bees harvesting plasma from these giant fucking cells running around but there's this big ass insect called the huntress who's abducting the smaller insects and turning them into statues <laughs> and that's no good you gotta kill her anyway and there, there here you can see some some more like a, the mall punk inspired environment concepts this is the Dream of the Crystal Lagoon. It's a misty island that you approach from a sea of clouds. Uh, full of these uh, little statue guys, right? As you can see from that statue there in the left picture. Terrorized by uh, giant sea creatures that you had to kill. <laughs> uh, there's one of my sea creatures that I made based on like a, a based on a shrimp. Uh, the, that guy would have popped out of holes and and and, and tried to and tried to get you. And as you can see in the other one, you got those little jellyfish. You jump on them, but you can only stay on them for a sec before the tentacles try to stab you. Ooh, what happened? Well, as you guys might have been able to tell by now, I had a really hard time coming up with like concrete level concepts to fit the the uh, the theme I was going for with these like systems thrown out of balance. The high level concepts were there, but I had trouble translating them into gameplay. <laughs> Uh, also, my inexperience at level design kind of bit me. The idea was way too ambitious. I mean, I mean, most of my ideas for levels boiled down to to kill and killing a boss in the end, and that just wasn't jiving with the uh, theme I was doing. So, yeah. But ultimately, the nail in the coffin that murdered the project I couldn't animate this this son of a bitch. 
This is my first time making a 3D game. I don't know why I thought I could animate a full humanoid rig. So I made a placeholder character. <laughs> then I got a completely new idea. I started making a completely different game based on the placeholder character. Uh, this, so this is my game, Lady Stardust, actually. It's, it's not like abandoned. I work on it every once in a while. It's been a while, but uh, there's a couple screenshots from that. So, I followed through with my ambitions of making a 3D game with very, with very little 3D game experience, and it actually did pan out a little bit. So, eventually I lost interest, though, in making Mike's World, but, you know, I'm not done with Mike. And I'm certainly not done with, 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 with 3D games, so... In the end, what I'm trying to say is, chase your wild ambitions, maybe they'll go somewhere, who knows. That's it. That's amazing, Liz. Thank you so much for sharing. <laughs> sure. All, all I can think of is the uh, that uh, song by Suicidal Tendencies. It's just Mike just wanted one Pepsi. Just one Pepsi. That's all he wanted. That's all he fucking wanted. <laughs> it's just one oh, Pepsi. I forgot to mention one thing. Check the voice text chat where I'm put where I put where I'm gonna post the uh, the main theme oh, from man. Mike's Worlds that I can post. Yes, absolutely. I definitely will definitely need to throw together a little EP of abandoned tracks from abandoned games. Oh, I got, I got, I got, I got, I got like, I, I got like a whole double album of those. <laughs> but yep, that's me. I'm done. All right. Next up, we have Summer talking about not necessarily abandoned game, but large portions that are abandoned from her game's design. Yee. All right. Share your screen. Kick us off. Yep, I can do that. Sharing. Mm -hmm. oh, go back. Nope, nope, nope. All right. Are Spoilers. Good? You're Spoilers. good. All right. Everyone knows that I can be quite verbose, so I'm actually setting a timer right now that will literally start howling in my in my ear if I go over five minutes. I am known to talk. I am very uh, verbose and propeloquent. Um, before I start, I'm Summer. I've been an organizer for uh, seven or eight years. I love what I do. If you ever have any questions about game development, come talk to me. I love helping people out. And uh, with that, I'm going to start my timer and I'm going to start talking. So Lido is a game I've been working on for a long time now. There have been a lot of ideas that have come together to make this game. For those who don't know what this game is, it's a lot of love, charm, fluffy dragons, cat puns, all kind of set in a science fantasy world. Plays like a platformer such as uh, Mega Man or Mega Man X. Um, and again, as Tyler kind of hinted at, I am absolutely not dropping Leto. In fact, Leto is coming out uh, next year. It has a Steam, or, uh, Steam Early Access play, uh, page right now. There's a free demo you can play. Uh, you can buy it now and start playing the latest stuff. I'm currently working on the last boss right now. So all of this coming together, as I said earlier, I had some really dumb ideas and this is me trying to put all these to rest. I have 50 slides and I have four minutes left. So I got to start speeding up here. Uh, making games is hard. It's really hard. Really, really hard. And you should never like, one way to make your like game development life harder is to have these ideas that you don't know what to do with. And I'm going to teach you how to like handle these bad ideas that you have. Uh, so yeah, this is my very official PowerPoint. Great, great font. Yeah, totally not the default stock Google uh, slides. Uh, first thing you could do, you can delegate. Uh, I've shown this before. I thought I could do title screens. I delegated it out. This is Zach. Zach is an artist. Zach is a professional. Uh, goodbye, uh, my old my old screen. Press F to pay respects. Okay, next next thing. Another thing you can do is you can drop. You just flat out drop your bad ideas. Uh, it's hard, but you can do it. Let's talk about that. Uh, Leo at one point had an inventory system. I don't know if anyone knew that. Uh, I drew it out. Oh, wait, there's more. Uh, I drew everything out. I had items. Uh, I started like scripting this son of a gun out. Yeah. I had an NPC. I had two NPCs. Uh, and then I threw it in the bin because it was too bloody complex. Uh, press F to pay respects. Uh, goodbye, Leto's inventory system. I had a character on the left-hand side here, that robot character. Uh, they did not make it into the game. And let's talk about why that happened. Uh, originally, this character was going to be a robot with a chainsaw, and that was going to be awesome! Uh, except that the sprite is kind of big, and I was getting, I was starting to realize that I, like, didn't know what I was doing, and so, like, I have this problem where I draw sprites way too big, and so, like, this sprite of one of my characters, he's, like, three times the size of Mega Man X, and trying to animate that is really hard, and I was looking at this character where it was going to be the same bloody problem, so I was like, okay, I'm going to shrink, I'm going to shrink, okay, I'm, I think I'm okay with this, okay. 
Uh, but then there's this other problem that I had with this this lovely little character here. Um, this is a cutscene that happens in game right now, but eh, about halfway through. And you know how many characters are on screen? There's like ten characters on screen. That's like way too many. Um, and I have to keep track of all of them. So not only do, is the sprite like, which by the way I'm not really in love with because it's no longer a robot with a chainsaw. I don't have room for this character anymore. Like, I I I can't fit this character in. There's too many characters on screen. Like, look at this. There's ten characters and they're all like related and they love each other and hate each other and it's there's so much I have to juggle as it is. So what did I do? Uh, I could just use two of these characters uh, for my companion system that I was trying to fill in so badly. Like, because that's what Leto has is this companion system where you can use these characters and they augment your abilities in combat. And I was just like, oh, wait, I can use these two characters that uh, you already care about. Awesome. Cool. Uh, rest in peace. Rest have to pay respects. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, robot character with a chainsaw. You're going to be so cool. I'm sorry. I don't know how to plan. I'm an idiot. I'm sorry. I miss you, but it's time to put you to bed. Okay. Next. The last thing you can do with your ideas is you can morph them. Uh, I wanted cute collectibles. This was some sketches. Uh, those became the seedlings. And these seedlings are in the game now. Nothing went into the, the graveyard. Ah, I juked ya. No, no pressing F. Seedlings are in the game. They're everywhere. There's three per level. They're very cute. Go collect them all. Yay! Okay. Last thing. I love character development. I love romance in games. I'm a big fan of Bioware games. I love these old Bioware games. I especially love the characters in these old Bioware games that you can romance. Uh, I see a picture of Cartho Nassi from KOTOR and my heart, my little heart just warms up. I love him so much and it just makes me so happy and I love that kind of character drama, okay? So, of course, as I'm walking into this game, I'm like, oh, I'm going to have these two characters. Like, you know, Leto's going to be able to date, you know, Tabs or Leto's going to be able to date Zur and it's going to be great! Uh, three quarters of the way through, I realized that Leto is kind of busy. She's dealing with all these antagonists, and she's finding out that her best friend is one of these antagonists. And her dragon gets kidnapped. Uh, she's not around. She's gone. <laughs> so it's like, okay, what do I do? Well, you let the idea morph. Oh no, I have 19 seconds left. Oh no. Um, you let the idea morph. They're now dating. It's awesome. I love it. These characters were made for each other. I'm so happy I did this. I'm so happy I let that idea breathe. Uh, rest in peace, Leto. I'll worry about Leto too. Last slide, four seconds left. I win! Feel free to run over if you want. Talk. <laughs> Feel free to take a couple seconds if you want to wrap up real quick. Oh. I'm sorry, I, I'm, the screaming is in my ear. The timer, it's too loud. It's screaming in my ear. I have to stop. <laughs> but in short, delegate, drop, or morph. Thanks for listening to me rant. I appreciate it. Whew, I did it. Thank you, Summer. Yes. And uh, we have two more talks coming up. Uh, next up, we actually have um, a talk from me and my good buddy, Eric, uh, also pre-recorded. Enjoy. Hey, folks. Hey, folks. Welcome to our uh, sad funeral for DOS Battalion, formerly Rail Rogue. I'll just get right into it. Uh, I'm Eric. I am primarily art and design fella of the two of us here. Um, I co-founded Polynite Games with Tyler back in 2015, I think, 2014. Somewhere there. Uh, one of those years. And uh, co-founded Dream Toaster with Tyler this year, 2020. And uh, I'm Tyler. I'm the kind of programmer tech half of the duo. Uh, we founded Polynite <laughs> together along with a bunch of other friends. Um, now just the two of us uh, are founding Dream Toaster. Um, we originally came together over Interspace, which was a flying game that we made for Switch, PS4, Xbox One, PC, Mac, Linux. Um, and uh, this game that we're talking about, Daz Battalion or Rail Rogue, is the game, it's the main game that we tried to make after Interspace. We wanted to make a game that ran on mobile, but also ran on PC um, to try out the market. Um, part of that's also because we had leads on the Apple Arcade and being able to give pitches to get into it. Um, we also wanted to make a game that was a bit more systems rich. Um, we previously had made mostly pretty one-dimensional games. Not one-dimensional, but uh, a bit sh more shallow on the system side. Whereas Eric and I have had, had, had a lot of conversations about RPGs, about what we like in them, about what we don't like in them. And we were really interested in making something a bit deeper. Um, we also wanted to make something with a unique setting um, that we could eventually turn into a full-time project, something that we knew would probably require day jobs early on, but it's something that we would focus on eventually turning into something that we're doing full-time. Um, that said, though, although we want to talk about Dawes Battalion, we want to talk about Railroad, 
um, I kind of want to say that there's kind of three versions of this game, that it's changed a lot over time, it's changed names, it's changed premises, so we want to talk about each of them. Uh, so the first version is Railroad, but it's also the fake Railroad. Um, the first thing that we did to try to get a pitch together in time to pitch to Apple for Apple Arcade, because um, we had a foot in the door before anyone knew that it was a thing, um, we wanted to put together a trailer for this game that showcased everything that it was going to be, everything that it supposedly was at the time. Uh, so we kind of hacked together a bunch of animations and made a fake trailer. And uh, we're kind of got all that together, got that already. We got music, animations, particle effects, models, um, and put together this thing with a pitch deck. And um, then things got delayed and the conversation didn't happen and the pitch didn't happen. The meeting kept getting pushed back. So eventually we kind of decided that we need to do something in the meantime. So we just started making it a real game. This is where we start pivoting from the Apple Arcade pitch trailer to the actual first playable version of Railroad, which is the second version of Railroad. Um, this Railroad also started development after quite a few of the people that we started Polynight with got day jobs, and day jobs that did not allow them to work at Polynight. So it kind of simmered down to me and Eric with Chris Miller, Chris being our sound guy. And so we kind of had to say, like, all right, well, we have a lot less people. How do we actually make this game with just the two of us on the Unity side of things? Um, so we started reworking the art style a little bit. We started reworking the systems and the designs to kind of be something that worked a bit better. But eventually we got together this demo that played. It had multiple encounters. So you got to fight three different encounters of enemies. Um, and we had this demo ready to showcase to people at GDC. We set up meetings with a bunch of different indie publishers. Um, we had time slots and we walked in with our laptop, pre-charged, backup batteries, headphones, you know, mouse, everything ready to kick out and play in a couple seconds into GDC. And this is when we really first showed the game to people to get feedback. And, um... and this is primarily more or less what every person said. Is this your actual art style? And the real answer was, yeah. And personally, we were really into it. Like, it was something that we were into. But in the moment, after getting the feedback and after about a half a second of intense eye contact between Tyler and I, the answer we gave was, ah, of course not. It's a total work in progress. Nothing here is final. It can all change. Nervous laughter. Ha 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 ha. Going home from GDC, we had a lot of feedback. We had other feedback on, the, on like the gameplay and stuff, but the art style feedback really cut deep, cut me deep, I guess, and really made us start to feel like maybe we needed to really dig into this and change and develop it more and kind of bring out the 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 there of the game, like what is it? Um, so I proceeded to draw like hundreds of trains and concluded that like no matter what I did, something about trains just felt so incredibly, inescapably lame. Like, I don't know what it was. Maybe it was, like, the fact that they were all pinned down to the rail or something, but, like, ugh, trains. But then I had this revelation, and I stuck spider legs, like mech legs, on one of the trains, and just, like, the clouds parted, and I knew suddenly that this was going to be a game about spider mechs. And I showed it to Tyler, showed it to Chris, and we all agreed, like, this is it. This is the direction. And we proceeded to uh, develop and reshape our art style and reform this game around a new premise, a new setting, and a new name, DOS Battalion. And basically, what we resolved to do was to rebuild the game around this new identity and present it again as a play the same playable but new skin at Let's Play in Dallas that summer, so 2019. Uh, and that gave us roughly like six months to do this. Uh, and yeah, we did. Like we built all the art, new scenes, new UI, uh, polished the mechanics and brought it to Let's Play. And Let's Play um, brought us like a lot of enthusiastic players, old and young, people who weren't into RPGs, like flocked to our setup, which granted included like a 20 foot banner um, and shirts. But still, like we got, we got like a lot of really good uh, impressions and feedback and we ourselves were really pumped up about it. Um, but in that feedback, those several pages of player notes and stuff, we started to kind of feel the the edges wearing away at, at, at our enthusiasm and, and at this game. And that kind of, by drips and drops, led us six months later to drop the game. So like from my perspective, why did we drop it? 
well, or why do we need to kind of put it in the ground? Well, so like the art style was like one of the major successes of DOS Battalion, but also kind of started to weigh on me. Like I wanted each mech to be readable at a distance on a mobile screen, have like a lot of personality, but like at the end of the day, the problem was, you know, how do you make spider mechs feel as cool and as personable as anime girls? It's really hard. Like there's a lot you have to do. Um, and then on top of that, like we wanted this super badass UI that really felt like Gundam, just like injected into your eyeballs. Um, and like, that's really hard. That's a lot to do, especially given how many menus the game has. Um, so just from a pure art scope perspective, like it was all going to be really cool, fun stuff, but like, holy crap, there was looking into it, like so much to do. And all of a sudden this game was like for one man art team, like a huge project. Yeah. And a lot of that also um, kind of mirrors in the code side and that from the very first trailer to the next playable, we get the game playable. Um, but then from GDC to Let's Play, I actually get kind of the RPG systems in. Whereas before there was kind of like damage reduction or healing and attacks, but you know, we got in actual like damage types like fire damage and dark damage and different resistances. Um, and we got all the different UI set up so that um, you know you could see what each enemy's resistances were. Um, that we'd kind of been slowly adding in a bit more RPG systems over time, um, but pretty quickly, like right after Let's Play, it's like all right, like let's take the next step. We got things we want to fix. We got things we want to change, um, and that's a lot. But we also just need to like make the rest of the game. So we have all these changes we want to make from Let's Play, but then we also have all right players need to be able to customize their mechs so all right we need to rework all of our prefabs and meshes and artwork pipeline to be able to work with that but i also need to make it so that it's not just a bunch of mechs in a unity scene that they're actually being spawned in based on like some kind of players persistent decisions so okay all right so i go do all the work to rework the stat system to where it serializes more easily it persists more easily it allows us to spawn in these mechs and customize and they're assembled modularly we can make presets of them through scriptable objects so that they can be spawned in based on editor things that we set up i get all that working it's like okay all right and you play it and not only did nothing really change because we don't have all the menus in to make the customizations, but I actually broke a bunch of things. So then I got to go fix all the broken things and then I got to go make the menu to customize the mechs and holy crap, that's a lot of work. But also the mech, the screen to customize mechs isn't that useful if you don't give the players random drops from encounters. So you need to make the random drop encounter screen and just this huge list of menus and UI from just things that you have to do in JRPG starts building up and up and up. And really quickly, it's just an overwhelming amount of code to write and an overwhelming amount of menus to design. And like Eric said, we decided that the menus had to be super cool and super awesome and feel diegetic. And that was just weighing us down and weighing us down. And during all of this, after Let's Play, my father had gotten a worse cancer diagnosis than before so i was dealing with that i was losing more time to family dealing with having a declining family member and all of this just kind of stacks up to having uninspired just miserable code work that doesn't interesting and you can't show people combined with all of that and just when 2020 tick ticked over eric and i just had an honest conversation of just like we're not going to finish this in a year it'll probably take us at least two years do we really want to focus on finishing this right now and the answer is kind of no just it's just too much for us right now and that's where we decided to drop Boz Battalion is just looking forward at this huge amount of work and the way yeah. that we created for ourselves mm -hmm. um, but that does bring us to takeaways um, like one thing mm -hmm. Eric and I just uh, talked about a second ago was um the UI that we just had decided that the UI need to be diegetic and we need to be cool. It need to be a part of the game. And realistically, like we could have questioned that and the game would be a little bit lamer with less interesting UI, but it would get developed a ton faster. It would be so much easier. We would just be able to prototype block stuff in, create some button prefabs and just kind of work and go and get stuff functioning. And if we'd been willing to interrogate that. So one of the big takeaways is just that really we needed to do a better job of interrogating what we thought was important about the game. Cause realistically, like the menus weren't the most important part of the game. It was like this weird one dimensional, like simplified streamlined tactics game. It wasn't the menus, you know? Yeah. Um, and yeah. And I, I think it's sort of the, to 
extend from that, like, you know, not only was the UI probably not that important, but what we really in game dev, especially as a small team, what you really want to do, especially with something as potentially maximal as a JRPG, is you want to find the thing that you're giving the world that's special and new and really get that right. So for us, I don't know, probably not sure what it would have been at this point, but whatever it was, we should have really doubled down on that one thing and really brought that out and kind of let the other things be functional, but not necessarily need to juice them up like 100%. Um, but I think this kind of gets also to um, like the juicing exercise kind of got gets to like one of the major, major learnings that we have had, I think, as game developers generally, which is that like when you're um, making games that you at some point want to show somebody, you still need to balance like doing things that are uh, that you can demonstrate that you can show with actually sustainable development practices like you for your own sake and also to have something that you can actually show for others you do need to do things that register with the end user with the player um, but you can't sacrifice actually building the core game and the core vision for that and a lot of that is just like what we could have done better was focus on doing those simultaneously that um we had a bad habit of doing a lot of really showable work and then digging a bunch of graves and having to kind of d pull ourselves out of this hole and then have to do a bunch of upkeep work and i think balancing that a bit better would have not only been better for motivation but it also would have helped us test and kind of build up less debt and also make less promises that we couldn't keep um, and I think one of the things that ties back to you, which I think is kind of a good thing to end on, is that we'd never really stopped developing pitches. One thing that we do a lot of is that we really develop games to show to publishers to try to get money to help us finish the game. Part of that's because of the way that Interspace had panned out for us, but also just... We walked into Dawes Battalion saying that we'd finish it no matter what, and we didn't care if we get publishers, but we never really changed our practices. We were always looking not only to the big next milestone that we would be able to show off to someone, um, but we were also really, really latched intensely on what they said, um, that when we walked away from feedback from publishers, we took what they said probably a little too seriously and didn't yeah. test it out with players and kind of get an actual feel for how people felt about, felt about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think just to end cap from my part, like on the art style specifically, like that desire to, when you're in pitch mentality, you want to please the highest bidder. You want to like give... You want to sell them the vision of what the marketplace wants. And so you are indexing on super flashy, like cool shit. And if they don't like what you're showing them, you're, you don't have a vision or a solid like game to fall back on. You are sort of at their whim, even just psychologically. And, and that's what happened to me. Like I went back from GDC and said like, all right, got to change hundred percent of this game because it just didn't resonate with the 10 people I showed it to. Whereas if we had, you know, had play testers and a, and a base and, and had sort of taken our time with it, we would have been able to say, you know what, like we know what this game is and we know who it's for ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, and that would have been incredibly valuable. And so in the end, rest in peace, Dawes Battalion. We're going to miss you. We spent years working on you. We learned so much from you, be it shaders yeah. that we took onto other projects or that we want to recreate this art style, that there's a setting that we really love, that there's story writing that we really loved. But in the end, I think we're, just ready to put this behind us that it's too much work and we have other things that we want to work on um, yep. rest in peace rest in peace man or really <laughs> we'll probably revive this game someday but probably the setting or kind of what it's about and the look and the spider mechs because spider mechs are cool but yeah definitely it's, you can't bear can't be, you can't keep a good spider mech down so <laughs> We'll see. We'll see what happens. We'll, we'll turn it into something else, and it'll be some other game, but not this one. But we might keep the name because Dodds Battalion's a dope name. Yeah, it's pretty cool. All right. All right. Well, thanks, everyone. Rest in peace. Yeah. Bye. Awesome. And uh, thanks, everyone, in the chats. F's in the chat for Spider Max. Um, uh, next up, we have our last talk. From Daniel, I'm going to move over to my room, forcibly. And turn that volume down. Hey, Daniel. Hey. Ready for me to share my screen? Absolutely. Go for it. Okay, Duke. All right. 
Take us away, Daniel. Cool. Hi, so this is Farewell to Gravity Gunners. Uh, we are gathered here today to celebrate the life and death of Gravity Gunners, a game that I wrote many years ago and completely destroyed all desire to make any sort of game ever again. Um, so a little bit about me. Uh, my name's Daniel, Daniel Fairley. I am a software developer. I've been writing code for the greater part of a decade uh, in an enterprise setting and even longer in college, uh, making weird prototypes and stuff. Um, I've made a few mobile games uh, that were super big on the Windows phone, um, which is not the greatest thing to brag about, but, you know, uh, the smallest feather in my hat. Uh, I've made a ton of goofy prototypes uh, over the weekends uh, just because I have a dumb idea and I prototype it and I laugh at it and I share some GIFs and then move on. Uh, I've also participated in a tremendous amount of hackathons around Dallas. Uh, I really enjoy doing those because instead of taking all my dumb ideas and making them into games, I get to make weird stuff like hacking coffee pots and whatnot and actually winning money, which is great, but neither here nor there. Um, uh, around the years that I was doing game development uh, on the side, uh, the Society of Play, or it was called Dallas Society of Play at the time, uh, was a huge part of my life. Um, I was an organizer. One of the organizers for Dallas Society of Play, uh, I enjoyed giving talks uh, about doing uh, hackathons and game jams. Uh, it was great. And I have a beard now, so neither of these images are really representative of who I am. But, you know, 2014, this was, this was me for sure. Um, so Gravity Gunners, um, it started with a single dumb idea, which was you can't stop spinning. And I just made a sprite and I just like, I don't, I think I was doing something else and I had it set to rotate and it just kept rotating and I just kept staring at it. And I was like, this is great. This is a game, obviously. So just this core concept of you can't stop spinning uh, just got stuck in my head. Uh, so I'm also a big fan of, Local multiplayer arena games, games like Towerfall, Samurai Gun, Nidhogg, uh, you know, Smash Brothers, just any games where you have some people playing locally and you're fighting each other and games that are really easy to get into, like one or two buttons, but then maybe have like some kind of crazy skill ceiling, uh, those kind of games. Uh, I really enjoy it. And I wanted to make a game like that, but I didn't want to make a game that was in the same, I guess, the same side of the spectrum of those other games, because those other games have really tight controls, uh, very precise movement. And I wanted to go the completely opposite end and just say, hey, you, you barely have any control over yourself besides shooting, and because you, you just can't stop spinning. And that's what makes the game fun. Uh, the the lack of control definitely goes against that the grain of the genre that I was trying to make this game in. And uh, I'll explain a little later why that kind of was a huge detriment to uh, the progress of development, um, but maybe not for the reasons you might think. Uh, so the game started uh, as Super Spaceman Shootout uh, way back in July of 2014. Uh, all of my prototypes have really dumb alliteration names. Uh, I'm pretty sure I was in the, we were probably on IRC at the time for Dallas Society of Play and had come up with Super Spaceman Shootout. And I just took the concept and ran with it. Um, around that time, that's when uh, Russell came up with the arcade cabinet. Uh, and that was perfect. Uh, because I wanted to make a multiplayer local game 
with simple controls and here comes Russell with a huge arcade cabinet that's multiplayer local with simple controls and super excited uh, to get my game on there. Uh, I helped create the Unity input controller for Society of Play uh, because the buttons were all keyboard buttons like A, B, C, X, Y, Z, like, and it was all just completely random. It felt like for each of the buttons and for all like the eight directions of the joystick. Uh, so I spent one weekend just banging all that out so I could share it with everyone else. So everyone else could get their games on the cabinet as quickly as possible. Um, another great part about the arcade cabin is that it's a really easy way to get real player feedback. It's one thing to bring your game in front of uh, people for the game dev meetups and get feedback that way, but you know, actually stick it in front of random people who just want to play an arcade game and get their input. This is perfect because you can spectate uh, just by you know standing on to the side behind them, whatever. And just watch people enjoy it. So development kicked into high gear. Um, I was super familiar with Unity already, doing mobile games and prototypes. Um, I could bang out pretty much any prototype I wanted to very quickly over the weekend. Um, I did all the art, sound effects, and development um, for the game. I reached out to a musician friend that I used for some of, mo some of my mobile games to make that completely obnoxious music that just loops forever. If you've ever played the arcade cabinet, you know what I'm talking about. Um, thankfully, I've completely forgotten what the music sounds like, and I intend to keep it that way. Uh, the I started bringing the game to uh, game, deck, game dev feedback sessions to see what everyone thinks. Uh, the Society of Play has a huge group of incredibly talented game designers, uh, artists, musicians, uh, enthusiasts, hobbyists, uh, and I really respected everyone's opinion. And it was great getting that positive feedback of, yes, this is this is fun. And really, that's that's all I really care about my games. I don't care if they're the best game. I just want it to be a fun game. So after a bit, I decide, yeah, I'm totally going to commit to taking this game all the way. I want to get this game out on Steam. Uh, I want to get it on consoles. I want to get it on Xbox One, PlayStation 3 or PlayStation 4, whatever it was out at that time. Uh, Nintendo uh, was definitely pushing their indie stuff uh, a little bit more. Um, and I was able to talk to a few Nintendo people at different conferences. Uh, the title eventually changed to Gravity Gunners, uh, much thanks to the Society of Play, one of the game dev meetups, because, you know, you can't, the alliteration names are only allowed for prototypes. If you're going to have a real game, you got to have a real name. Um, and even though this is a slight alliteration, it's not three words, which were the majority of my prototypes. Um, and got a artist buddy that does a lot of pixel art uh, for mobile games that I worked on, uh, gave me this crazy good new title screen. Um, and things are just great. Like I... I'm super gung-ho about making this game. Um, the feedback I'm getting is great. The game is fun. Uh, it, it's with the space physics of it all. It, it's random. It's chaotic. Um, it's, it's just a great, great, great game for people who have never really played games and people who are absolute masters of games like Nidhogg and Samurai Gun. So January 2015, Pack South rolls around, and the Society of Play is working alongside Microsoft to uh, put up a booth, and the arcade cabinet is going to be there. And I also have uh, my laptop and some Xbox controllers 
uh, off to the side to show my game. And this is the first really big conference uh, that I've been able to show a game at. And I was super excited to see what just random people thought about it. Um, I've been showing the game in front of the same set of Society of Play people over and over and really wanted to get some new input or just, you know, some raw input from people who just play games, not so much design games. Uh, I crashed with some college friends in uh, in San Antonio and got their input on the game and they absolutely loved it. It was great laughing at each other, uh, shooting bullets everywhere, zipping around the screen, blowing up. It's It was just, it was perfect. Um, and uh, Richard Garriott was also showing a game, uh, Shroud of the Avatar, at the same booth. And so he had the opportunity to play my game. And he said he loved it, which is just, it's Richard Garriott, you know? Like, he, he made all the Ultima games. The, the dude's huge. He lives, or used to live in a, a castle, a literal castle. You know, every, people refer to him as Sir Richard. And having this legend of, you know, game design and game development say he really enjoys my game that that was just huge huge for me um and that was just really the cherry on top of the rest of the uh weekend um the diversity of the crowd really put the game concept to the test um i watched uh a dad and his son play it together uh, let's see. Um, yeah, I watched a dad and his son play it together. Uh, you know, he could barely reach, the kid could barely reach the buttons. Um, but, you know, the kid was yelling when, you know, he was able to shoot his dad. Uh, that was awesome to watch. I watched uh, four young guys, probably high school aged, uh, playing Gravity Gunners and uh, literally screaming at each other i mean they were shoulder to shoulder but literally screaming at each other about events that happened in the game um one of them got punched in the arm after like a stray bullet clipped him like from wrapping around the screen uh that was awesome to watch um i watched a mom have her two sons play and i offered the mom a controller and i said like, hey you should play too and she's like oh no you know i don't play games i'm like look all you gotta do you just you just got to push this green button and she had her arms crossed and I, you know, she grabbed the controller, but her arms were still crossed. And all she did was push the green button, uh, which was enough to actually play. And she ended up like shooting one of her kids and they were just so impressed that their mom, you know, was able to, to kill one of them. Uh, and, you know, she's smiling. The kids are smiling. Everyone's going nuts. It's just, it was great. And, you know, that's that really cemented the fact that, like, I came up with a simple design that was approachable by a huge crowd. Didn't matter if you were super pro, you know, champion of the world, Nidhogg player, or a mom with her arms crossed that refuses to play video games. Like, you could, you could compete. Um, it's fun. So yeah, the um, development's still going strong. Um, just the f how much people are enjoying it uh, on the arcade cabinet really just fueled everything for me, uh, fueled all my game development. Um, March rolled around, um, and I, I actually was able to go to GDC I was uh, invited by Microsoft to show off some Kinect stuff that I had done for a hackathon. And we were kind of in the corner of the Microsoft area. So I was able to like plug up my laptop to one of the spare TVs and leave my controllers out. I mean, they were Xbox controllers, so they were Microsoft approved, you know, and let people play Gravity Gunners at GDC. So I can... I can officially say that like, I was able to show a game at GDC, which not a lot of people can say they've done. And I get to 
sort of half truth say I got to show my game. I mean, it was there. I showed it, and uh, it wasn't why I was at GDC, but you know, it was fun. Um, the arcade cabinet ended up traveling around Plano, Richardson. We were at Vickery Park, so you know, watching drunk people play it. That's you know, a plus, awesome. I don't know, draft house. That's just random people who aren't even there to play games. You know, who can who can walk past and a free arcade cab and not you know mash some buttons? Like it, that's just a great experience. Uh, so around after March, uh, things kind of slowed down. Uh, and I'm starting to uh, try to polish the game. Um, I have Xbox uh, One dev kits, uh, and I want to start polishing. The, and the only feedback I'm getting now is from the game dev meetups. And, you know, everyone has an opinion on how the game could be better. I mean, that's, that's why we share the games that we do is to get feedback. Um, and I respect everyone's opinion tremendously um, because, you know, they're, they're real game designers that have actually, you know, made games and I'm just a hobbyist. Um, so I start iterating on all these ideas and I don't like any of them because, you know, that core concept of just not having control and you're just, you can't stop spinning. And everyone's like, you should, you should stop spinning. Or you should be able to control the spin. And I was hesitant, but I was like, you know what? I I should iterate. I should try out these ideas. And that becomes the majority of my time is just trying to make the game as fun as it was on the arcade cabinet um, from the version that was that probably still is on the arcade cabinet to uh, what everyone thinks, you know, like, hey, like let's make it more competitive let's let's add these things in um and you know it's that's not fun development for me um and the comments from those game dev feedbacks like they start to affect me personally which you know is never the intent of anyone uh, when they're you know giving opinions everyone's respectful that like no one was like telling me my game was bad um and I don't want to deviate from my main idea that you can't stop spinning. And uh, I knew it was fun. I watched people play it, and they enjoyed it. It was fun. And uh, it felt like everyone was saying, hey, your game is not fun. And it would be better. It would be fun if you had these other things that would make it fun. And, you know, it's it starts to affect me personally. and. Uh, and things kind of start to go downhill, uh, from here. Um, and that was like the last commit I made on the game. I just kind of quit, uh, game development period around that time. Uh, the burnout of just iterating and not enjoying what I'm creating sets in, um, and I'm also used to spending no more than like three months on any game that I've written, uh, any mobile game I've done or prototype or anything like that. Um, and it's been a year of Gravity Gunners. Uh, and it was, it was a new concept to me. Um, the version I left on the arcade cabinet is what I consider done. But if you look at my Git repo, it's just a smattering of iterations of let me control the spin and control the dodge direction and maybe a boost that changes the direction of the spinning and stuff like that. Um, alongside this, I was also working on a mobile game with uh, some online people that I worked with before. And we had uh, cranked out this mobile game that we had been working on for six months, was which was also a huge project. Um, and it got zero traction on mobile, and that just killed killed my hobby uh, for me. Um, also, that winter, 
uh, on top of everything, like I was going through a divorce. So it was just like, my game is bad. My mobile game is bad. And my marriage is bad. Everything's bad. And I just like shove it all into GitHub and the closet and everything else and just like go into hiding. Uh, and that's that's that for Gravity Gunners. Um, so, but then the game was resurrected. Um, it was February of 2016, maybe like four or five months. Like one weekend, I was just like, you know what? I'm just going to rewrite this game from scratch. Um, I contract out the art with Alex Swaim, um, who I'm sure is still part of the Society of Play. Um, made these great, great sprites for me. Um, and it just really breathes new light, life into the game for me. And it's just absolutely gorgeous. Uh, we have like the scrolling background and then background sprites and foreground sprites. And everything just looks amazing. And I'm just super excited about, you know, starting all over and just making the game that I want to make, not showing it off and just, I'm going to finish Gravity Gunners. Um, so I start working. I spent another two months working on alternate skins. Um, I reached out to Vlambeer about having YV in the game. Uh, and they said, sure. Um, I actually set up one of my e Xbox One dev kits to get a build push to it so I could actually like see it working on a console. Uh, I started to learn shaders, which is crazy voodoo science, um, to give even more customization. Uh, for the colors of the ships, or not really the ships, but the players. Um, and that went along for a couple months. And then the anxiety of making a game creeps up on me once the game starts looking like what the arcade cabinet version looks like. And I just couldn't shake that anxiety of, like, ugh, I'm making a game that's fun but no one's gonna like it and i just can't shake that uh and really like from that point on like i hadn't done any game development since uh and i eventually left uh the society play as an organizer and just kind of went my own way and started doing other artsy things as hobbies and really haven't picked up uh game dev since um but I guess if there's a moral to the story, it's just you should make the game you want to make. Uh, opinions are just that. They're just opinions. Uh, feedback's super important, but you should never deviate from your vision. Um, I had that one, one core concept, and that really should have been the concept that I stuck with uh, the whole way through. Um, and that's it. Goodbye, Gravity Gunners forever. Rest in peace, Gravity Gunners. We'll miss you. And um, that's pretty much it. Thank you so much, Daniel, for giving your talk. Gravity Gunners is a game of legend in the Society of Play. It's one of the first games that is always booted up on the arcade cab. It's still on there whenever uh, conventions or in-person events exist again. Then um, we surely will uh, be playing Gravity Gunners uh, in its completed form. Um, but that said, that's all we have for the stream. Um, thank you again to all of our amazing speakers. Um, Thank you again to our patrons. Uh, we'll be hanging out in the Discord after this. We'll be talking about talks. If you've got any questions for anyone that's spoken, I'm pretty sure everyone's going to be in the Discord. So just come hang out. We'll be chatting. And uh, like I said, we do the Discord Hangouts every single Thursday. And we have a special events every month. And uh, we'll see all of y'all soon. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much for listening. Um, just remember, it's okay to not finish things. It's good to not finish things. It's good to not finish things that are toxic to you. Um, but, you know, just decide what's healthy for you and what you want to make and stick to it. And uh, it's okay to acknowledge that you want to stop doing something. And uh, hopefully that's a okay kind of attitude to have. Anyways. <laughs>